Hey, everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, the new structured logging package slog that's in Go 121. I'm a software engineer in the Go team, and I had the privilege of working on this. I'll talk about why we put it in the standard library now, give you a tour of the API, uh, what we did to make it fast, and why we did it. Um, I'll talk about the entire process from conception to finally getting into the standard library, and what comes next. So why did we add structured logging to the standard library? Well, first, let's remember what was there before and is still there, the log package. Uh, you can do formatted output with log.printf and friends. Uh, and you get lines like this that give you the time and a, and a message. And that's great, especially for command line programs where there's a few log lines and a person is going to be looking at them. It works fine. But when you get to servers that are generating thousands and millions of log lines, you want some automated way to filter them and sort them and organize them. And uh, unstructured text doesn't work so well for that. And you can't really change the structure of the output of the log package. So instead of unstructured logging, people do structured logging, which means instead of some human readable phrase or sentence, you use a bunch of key value pairs, like this key equal value format that you see below. And you make that easy to parse so that you can do all sorts of automated processing on it. Um, and we know this is important to the Go ecosystem because a lot of packages do this. Uh, from Logris, which has many importers, even though it's actually not even maintained anymore. Uh, and there's many others that followed. Uh, so we know logging is important, um, and that's fine. And normally, just because there's a lot of packages out there, we wouldn't add yet another one to the standard library. So why did we do that for logging? Well, there's a problem, because if your application imports a bunch of packages, as most do, and each uses its own logging package, then you have to wrangle them somehow to work together. You want your logs to look the same. So you want to have the same output format, use the same names for the different keys. And that can be challenging if every package you import is using a different log package. So we saw an opportunity to put something in the standard library that would help to unify this system and uh, have the packages work together. So what does slog look like? Well, our goals here were to make it easy to use, because it's Go, to make it fast, and as I just said, to make it interoperate with other packages. Um, and to do that, we had this two-part architecture where there's like a front end called the logger that you would use to do your actual logging. And that creates a record which it passes to the back end, which is a handler. And the handler is an interface so that people can write their own handlers so you can uh, adapt handlers to other situations and so on and produce different output formats. So we're mostly you're not going to see the handler in this part of the talk because as a regular user, you won't do anything with it except to create one. So here we, we're creating a new logger that uses one of the two built-in handlers, the text handler. That's going to write to standard out. And we log something at the info level that has a message and three attributes, three key value pairs. And you can see the format is that key equal values format I was just showing you before. Um, and if we instead want to JSON, all we have to do is change the text handler to the JSON handler, which is the other built-in handler we provide. And then you get JSON output. Now, for most people, the speed of that API is going to be fine. But if you need more speed, you can use this log adders method that takes a few more arguments. But most importantly, instead of taking alternating keys and values, it takes these adder values, uh, which you construct with methods like functions like slog.string and slog.int. Um, and then you get the same output. It's just a little faster. And some people like this anyway, because the keys and values are more closely associated. So an adder is just a key and a value. The key is a string. The value, though, is not the type any, or empty interface, which you might expect. It's the special slog.value type. And that's a performance optimization, which I'll mention again later. Uh, let me talk about levels. Everyone has their own idea of what good levels are. So we said, well, they're integers, so there's plenty to choose from. Pick any ones you want. We named four of them. We put spaces between those names, so you can add other levels between them. Um, we made info b0, because int 0 is the default in Go, and info is the natural default for, for log messages. And the result is that these are actually the same as the open telemetry logging standard. They're just offset so that info is 0. And to use levels, there's a level type. You can use it as a flag if you want. You can put it into one of these handler option uh, types and, and pass that as a second argument to one of the new handler functions. 
and um, then that handler will only output log messages at that level and above. Now, when you do this with level, that handler is uh, that that logger and that handler are locked into that level. You can't change it later. And a lot of people want to be able to dynamically change the level of their logging. Like they have a maybe they have an HTTP route which sets the logging level to debug, and suddenly all their they get all these debug logs for debugging. So you do that with something we call a level var, which, as you can see, is used exactly the same way, except when you set a level var, everybody who has one sees the change immediately. It's like a, a concurrency-safe pointer to a level. Another feature of slog is groups. Here we see a group being used to group multiple attributes into one. And in the JSON format, at least, that outputs as a JSON subobject. Now, this is one way you can use a group directly when you log something. But uh, another idea is that if you have a type that you want to log in a certain way as a collection of attributes, you can implement the log value method on that type and return a group. And then whenever someone logs something of that type, it outputs as a group. And you don't have just this log value method can be used for things other than group. You can just have things format differently or whatever you want. Another use for groups is solving the problem of conflicting keys. So here, this application uses thing one and thing two. And thing one treats value as an integer, and thing two treats value as a string. And so your log lines have a mix of these keys, uh, different uh, types for these keys. And that often confuses downstream processors. They choke on this. Um, so one way to solve that in slog is to create a new logger that's qualified by a group. So when you say logger.withgroup thing one, you get a logger, and all the output from that logger will be qualified by group one. So you pass your thing one and thing two subsystems, different loggers qualified by the groups, and the output now, well, they both have a value key. That value key is nested inside something with a different key. So no more conflicting keys. While we're on the subject of methods that start with with, there's a method that's just with on a logger. Um, and that lets you add attributes to the logger. So here, at the top of a request, we're taking the default logger and adding the URL path to that logger. We get a new logger. And now everything produced by that logger will have that attribute, that path equals value attribute in it. So that's not only a convenience, but it's also an optimization. So that was a quick tour of the API. Let me talk about uh, the speed. Why does speed matter in logging? This is a partial answer. Um, logging can be in the inner loop. Servers process a lot of requests. Requests generate a lot of log messages. Some of them require non-trivial trivial processing. The problem with just this answer is it doesn't say why ordinary the speed of a perfectly ordinary written Go program isn't sufficient. Why do we have to optimize slog to be extra fast? And for that, the best place to look is the history of logging in Go. Um, so it started in, or structured logging, that is. Uh, and it started in 2014 with Logris, um, which, as I mentioned, is still very popular. But it's got a quite slow API. You have to construct a map every time you use it, and that takes a lot of time. The people at Uber noticed that their servers were running slow with Logris, so they developed Zap in 2017. And that's much, much faster. And it's still quite popular. And then that triggered a spate of further optimizations. I think the most famous one is zero log, where people got even more speed out of logging. Uh, and you can see there's certainly users of that, but not nearly as popular as Logris and Zap. So based on this, we could see that speed was important, but we felt it was good enough to get the performance of Zap. Um, so that's what we aimed for, and that's what we achieved. We did look at zero logs API, which is actually a lovely API, but we did not see how to make it work without in a safe way. There's a use after free potential bug in the, uh, in the zero log API, and we did not want to put that into the standard library. So uh, four general ideas for making things faster, not, not necessarily specific to this project. Uh, and the first is to know what you want to make faster. So how is your package going to be used? If you can't answer that because you haven't written it yet, you can look at similar packages. Well, it was nice that we waited to do slog, because we had a lot of open source code that used these other packages that we could examine. So we did that. And I'll just show you one, one graph. And this is the, uh, so on the right, you see a typical zap 
a log call that uses three attributes. So we counted, we wrote a, this is a cumulative histogram of the number of attributes in log calls. And you see that once you get to about five, that's the tiny circled number there, um, you've got about 95% of all calls, and then there's some long tail. So if you can make uh, calls with uh, five attributes or fewer fast, you're probably covering most calls. So we then wrote benchmarks with that in mind. So this benchmark happens to use five attributes. We picked common attributes. I did another histogram that counted the different types of attributes, and uh, there were only about eight common ones. Um, so five of them are here. Um, we use this run parallel method on the benchmark type in the testing package because that sort of mimics the environment that you typically see logging in. Uh, highly concurrent servers that are doing a go routine per request, they're all doing logging. So uh, that's the right way to benchmark that. We also tested with more attributes, uh, up to 40, I think, uh, just to make sure there were no performance cliffs. And when you do that, when you write code that does something uh, 5, 10, 20, 40, the natural instinct of a programmer would be to make a slice and then sub-slice that for each benchmark. And, and so uh, you'd use a slice up to 5, dot, 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 instead of writing out the call. And that would be a mistake, because the compiler will generate different code in that case, and you'll get different numbers. So uh, in general, in benchmarking, you want to write the call as it would actually appear. That's not the place to take shortcuts. And my last tip on benchmarking is this great program written by other people on the Go team, Benchstat, that will uh, let you compare two different benchmark runs. It'll tell you which one is faster, by what percent. It'll even tell you if you don't have enough samples to make a statistically significant conclusion. Uh, third step is about designing APIs. Sometimes you have to design the API with speed in mind. So we have log adders, which I talked about as the fast API, and that uses a variadic argument of adder instead of any, and that's, uh, that, that is what helps it get fast. Um, another, uh, another part of the API is the back end, the handler interface, which you see on the slide there. And uh, since the job of the handler interface is to take a record from the logger and handle it, you'd expect it to have a handle method, and it does. But the other three methods are there purely for optimization. So the purpose of enabled is it's called very early in the log line when you say logging.info or whatever. Um, and if it decides that this log line's never going to make it out, it can return false, and you've stopped the logging process right there before you've done any other work. And the other two methods are there for that logger.with feature where you can uh, put an attribute in a logger early on and then use that logger many times. If you could just pre-format the attribute at that moment when you say logger.with instead of formatting it every time you actually use it, uh, you might be able to save a lot of time. And, and that's what those other two methods let the handler do. They can, it can pre-format those attributes. Uh, so that's it for the general purpose uh, principles of making something fast. Uh, and then getting down into the, into the weeds, uh, we optimized for allocation because we found, at least for this particular package, allocation was the main, main determinant of how fast things ran. So a couple of ideas that we used there was to make logger a concrete type that helped with avoiding allocation when you called it. That record type that gets passed between the logger and the handler uh, it has to have a slice of adders because people could have any number of adders they want. Um, and slices typically require allocation. But what we did was we put in a fixed size array so that if you had fewer attri attributes than the size of that array, we wouldn't have to do the allocation. What's the size of that array? Five, because we figured out that that was the magic number for getting most of the calls. Um, that value type I showed you before trades a little bit of space to reduce allocations for some things. Uh, over, over using an any. So if you put a string in a value, you won't get an extra allocation, whereas you typically will with an any. And then one very common thing that a lot of people do is for the byte buffers that we use to actually format the data, we use a sync pool to um, be able to reuse them so we don't keep allocating them. Let me talk about the process that led to SLOG. It started over 18 months ago when we realized from the Go developer survey and our own our own data that this was logging, structured logging was something that we probably should think about adding to the standard library. So we came up with a preliminary design. We shared it inside the Go team 
We shared it with logging experts, both inside and outside of Google. We revised it. Um, and at some point, we felt uh, we were at a point where we could open it up to public discussion. So we started a GitHub discussion, which is how we do large-scale changes now for, for things in Go, because it's easier to do things on, the, on a discussion. Uh, and that got about 300 comments. Uh, a lot of them were very helpful. We added groups as a result of that. We renumbered levels twice because people wanted that. Um, and after a couple of months, we felt we had a really solid design, so we started the, the official proposal on the GitHub issue tracker. Uh, that ended up with over 800 comments. Uh, there was a lot more discussion about details and features. We added some more things there, removed things, as I'll show you in a second. Um, and by March, we accepted the proposal, although there were still, it was such a large API that there were still about 10 issues that we hadn't completely figured out. So there were, there were 10 additional proposals after that Mar March point when we accepted the main proposal that we worked through in the next month or so. And there had been an implementation of SLOG in the EXP repo uh, throughout, tracking all the changes so people could play with it. So it wasn't a lot of work to move that into the standard library. And we did that, and when Go 121 was released in August, SLOG was released along with it. So a couple of features of SLOG and uh, what happened to them as a result of the proposal process. We had this idea that uh, it would be good to put a logger in a context because then you could set it up at the top of a call chain and it could pass through a lot of functions that didn't care about logging to some lower level function that wanted to log. Seems perfectly fine to me. I've used that before. Other people used it. There's 100 packages or more that do that just for Zap. We didn't think it was a big deal. But we got a lot of negative feedback. People called it smuggling. They called it an anti-pattern. I tried to explain that anti can be good, antidote, antibody, antipasto, but they weren't buying it. We also got a lot of people uh, who were happy to do it, um, which is our feeling. So, but ultimately, we decided to remove it because, oops, because uh, it, it was just two functions that were separable from everything else. We can always try to bring them back later. Uh, it wasn't really crucial to the proposal, and it was controversial. So we took it out. Um, now, alternating keys and values was another thing that created a tremendous amount of dissent. People called it breakage, a lot of disapproval about it. Someone said, get rid of all convenient shortcuts. Uh, my favorite, I hate passing attributes as keys and values from the bottom of my heart. But here we decided to keep it. Um, and there's three reasons. The first one is that you can still use the adders, slog.int and so on, with calls to info and so on. Um, but that didn't fully address our critics who were complaining more about the readability of this than the writability, so we get that. Well, we noticed, again, looking at the open source world, that there were plenty of successful log packages that used alternating keys and values. Um, and I think the, the biggest determination is that we, you know, Go is a language that should be fun to write, it should be light on the page, and we felt it would just be too much toil to have to write slog.string and slog.end every time you wanted to write a log message. You're welcome to do it but we didn't want to make you have to do it. And I should mention that I don't have on the slide, we did add a vet check so that if you mess up your keys and values, uh, we have a pretty good chance of finding that in a vet check. My personal feeling about working with the community, first of all, it was incredibly valuable. Slog would not be nearly as complete or as useful to people if we hadn't gone through that public discussion process. Um, I found Almost entirely that process was thoughtful. People were very professional. It was inspiring to collaborate with the whole world on a piece of software. That was really cool, and it was a lot of fun. So I want to thank everyone who participated in that discussion. What's next for SLOG? Well, now that it's in the standard library, of course, everyone's going to drop all their existing logging code and switch to SLOG. No, don't do that. Uh, the logging packages are fine. Don't cause churn in your code base by ripping stuff out that works. But what we do expect to see is that new code might start using it. And also, the existing log packages will have shims to slog so that they can interoperate together and with slog code, which was exactly what we were aiming for at the beginning. So you can find the documentation for slog in the usual place on pkg.go.dev. And there's also a wiki page that has a lot of helpful additional resources, like handlers that people have written. 
I hope you have as much fun using Slog as I did uh, working on it. Thank you very much.